Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, this is session number 130 tonight. As we keep moving along, as we return to the Council of Elrond, I guess I should get used to saying that, right? Uh, and uh, and here we go. So, um, so I think we're on, right? My, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to double check, make sure I'm streaming on the right channel. I think I'm streaming on the right channel, so that's good. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, so welcome back. So this week, just to cut uh, the, uh, my announcements are mostly about moots. So, um, the, that we've got three moots that are coming up that I wanted to make sure that you knew about. Uh, first, of course, and most urgently, is Tex Moot. That is coming up in just a week and a half now, on the 8th of February. It's been a long time between moots. It's been since Bay Moot in November, uh, right around Thanksgiving time. Uh, and, but now, finally, as we get into February, we begin our, our spring moot season. So I'm excited to be going out and uh, visiting with folks again. Uh, so that, as I say, f Saturday, February 8th, uh, and you can still join us there. And then, of course, SoCal Moot. Yes, praise Moyer. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, to meeting you there as well. I know there are a couple of you who are going to be there at SoCal Moot. That's going to be fun. Uh, that's going to be in the Netflix headquarters out in Hollywood. Houston, Texas is where Tex Moot is. Um, so and those are separated by two weeks. We've got SoCal Moot on the 22nd of February and Tex Moot on the 8th of February. So, um, uh, there we have uh, the, our regional moots, our, our immediately upcoming regional moots. And then third, of course, we have myth moot. Now, that's not very imminent. That is at the end of June, uh, but registration is open now, and we have an early bird registration period where you can register for a reduced rate. Uh, so, I definitely wanted to um, I uh, wanted to, to mention that and bring that to your attention, especially since this week we have a really exciting announcement about uh, something that's happening at MythMoot, which I am really, really looking forward to. So uh, let me uh, show you this. Okay. Um, so this is our MythMoot page. Those of you who were there last year, of course, will recognize the photograph, which is a photograph from our... Uh, reenactment of the flight to the Ford. That, of course, is uh, 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 Corita, who was portraying the role of Frodo, riding on Asphaloth down towards the Ford, uh, and uh, it was uh, that was awesome. Anyway, okay, so this is our Mythmoot page, and you can uh, you can see details. There are the dates: the 25th to 28th of June. Uh, and uh, scrolling down, there's all kinds of useful information on this page. We have our call for proposals, lots of detailed information about different kinds of ways in which you could participate at MythMoot and all the information you need in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to register to apply for that. So lots of cool information here. And then, of course, information about MootCast and a link to our MootCast page so you can learn about how MootCast works. If you can't join us, you can at least join us virtually through MootCast. Uh, all the different rates for the different, you know, days and things that you can come. This is our, our full early bird pricing package uh, and all that stuff. And yes, there's we're going to have the room of requirement again. Valori uh, uh, runs our room of requirement, which is uh, uh, which is really fun. I've, I've loved that. We've done that now two years, I think, right? The last two years at MythMoot, we've had the room of requirement and it's been, it's been a wonderful addition. The thing I wanted to emphasize though, is this is our new announcement is about Dr. Verlin Flieger who's coming. Now, Dr. Verlin Flieger is one of the, uh, uh, one of the, just the, 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 the rulers of the Tolkien realm. She is one of the most distinguished, uh, wonderful Tolkien scholars, you know, living in the, still living in the world. Um, uh, if you've done any work uh, with Tolkien, even many of the, the recent editions of his uh, newly released stuff, a bunch of that, like almost everything that wasn't edited by Christopher has been edited by her. She's the one who did the, the Cooler Vaux, for instance. She did Smith of Wooten Major. She did with Doug Anderson uh, on fairy stories. Um, really, um, 
uh, really, really awesome stuff. And of course, her own critical work and, and collections of essays are uh, are really wonderful. She also, so she's got, she's releasing a new book this year uh, called Arthurian Voices, and uh, she's going to be debuting that at Mythmoot this year. We're going to have a special sort of book release celebration of hers, and included in that release, um, she wrote a play called The Bargain, which is inspired by Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, one of, uh, uh, one, you know, uh, which is high on the list of, uh, of Tolkien's favorite uh, works of, of literature. De La Mancha, she will be there, yeah. Uh, Rowan Fleger is going to be there at the conference. Um, and uh, anyway, so, uh, so she wrote a play, as I say, called The Bargain, and we're going to perform it. We're going we're gonna to do a Reader's Theater uh, performance of it. Uh, and I... Uh, I think I've been cast as Sir Gowan in this. Anyway, I'm definitely participating, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, this is so we're going to have this special live performance of the play out of her book. Uh, we're going to be, you know, she's going to be there talking about her book, and uh, it's 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 going to be great. So uh, really excited about. Um, about is a lot of people don't realize that she has uh, written and published uh, fantasy novels of her own. Um, uh, Dr. Flieger has as well. So uh, really, uh, really cool. See, Tony, I was kind of also thinking that, like, you know, really, I, I would probably make a better Green Knight than I would make uh, Sir Gowan. But, you know... Uh, if, uh, if, if, if the author wants me to play Sir Gowan, I'll play Sir Gowan. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, so yeah, anyway, that's the play. So please do come. This is going to be, I, again, our regional moots are wonderful. You know, we try to make those as available and accessible as we can. That's why we're doing them all over the place. So that hopefully there will be one within some kind of range of you. Uh, and uh, you can come for the day. It's a, it's a one-day event, so it doesn't take a lot of time. And it costs very little money. Uh, and uh, But it's a great chance to get together with folks who are... Um, you know, other folks who are who are fans who are near you. Mythmoot, though, is the big deal, right? This is our our once a year uh, big get together, and uh, if if you've never been there, uh, you you need to come. It's it's uh, it's fantastic. Oh, Brandon, this is not Mallory's Sir Gowan. No, 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 no. This is uh, this is uh, this is the this is the heroic Sir Gowan. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, anyhow, so um, uh, so that's that's uh, that's where we are. So I definitely wanted to. Yeah, as uh, Dime says, any chance to see Doctor Flieger again is worth all the flying. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you've never gotten to meet her in person, she is uh, just a wonderful person to to meet and to get to know. Uh, extremely kind uh, and um, uh, she's uh, uh, she's it's I, I, as. Dime says she's totally worth the price of admission just for the chance to get to hang out uh, with Rowan Flieger. She is absolutely kind as Christmas, uh, JJ. No question. No question. Uh, even kinder than Christmas, Dime says Dime from Alaska, where I suppose Christmas is not always kind, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Cool. So... I just wanted to share that with you guys. That is one of our uh, uh, sort of exciting pieces of news. One other really small thing, which I wanted to, and many of you who have registered for things will uh, will notice. Uh, if you're new with us, this won't strike you. But if you've registered for a bunch of events for us before in the past year, you might have noticed this. And that is... We have a new registration system. Uh, if you go to register, you will go to this page. It's a little bare bones because it's still kind of a pilot. Uh, the events registration is the very first thing that we're kind of rolling out uh, and working with. Um, but this is a new custom built registration system uh, for us. So no more third party, complicated third party thing with many, many screens and uh, a separate login you have to create and and uh, and everything else. This is just really simple and direct. Uh, so this is our page. And then you go here to say the text moot page, because that's the one that's coming up soon. Uh, just a really simple registration page. And that's it. So um, it's um, it's much simpler. Uh, it's much more streamlined, uh, and it's uh, it's it's cheaper for us. We're not paying fees to a third-party service, and anyway, so it's pretty exciting. But I just wanted to 
you'll notice. You'll notice if you haven't signed up for either of these, and these are our first three events, the ones that are on this list here, Tex Moot, uh, Myth Moot, and SoCal Moot, are the first three that have been on this brand new system. Uh, so if, if you, I just wanted to draw your attention to it, uh, if you are a regular at our events, and you uh, log in and you're like, whoa, what is this? Uh, I didn't, I don't recognize this. It's because it's new and it's better. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so those are our announcements uh, for, t oh, one last quick thing I wanted to mention. Um, some of you on our Twitch channel might have noticed we have a new show uh, that uh, has begun on our channel here. Um, over the uh, in 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 January, just this past month, uh, and that is the Signum Academy. So Signum Academy is our kids program. Uh, it's focused on on reading fantasy literature with kids, um, and uh, they're broadcasting on the first and third Mondays of every month at seven thirty. Um, and uh, they're going to be doing so in February. They're going to be doing uh, so. Their first one is going to be this coming Monday, the first, f the first Monday of February. Uh, and uh, they're doing an introduction to the Fellowship of the Ring uh, and some of Tolkien's old English fan fiction uh, there. So it's a really, uh, really cool, smart, uh, uh, engaging program for kids. Um, and I just wanted to draw your attention to that because it's uh, it's pretty neat. So. Uh, that is the, um, uh, as I say, one of our newest shows on the Twitch channel here. Every first and third Monday of the month, so this coming Monday will be, so you can join the Signum Academy for that. And of course, uh, catch any of the video recordings after the fact as well. Okay, so let us get back to the Council of Elrond then. Uh, before we return to Elrond, I only have one uh, thing that I wanted to touch on quick because it was uh, it was a question relating to our discussion from last week uh, from Blood the Inspirer, which I thought was a uh, was a very thoughtful comment. He says in episode one twenty nine, one possible reading regarding Boromir's exc exclamation of Isildur took it that is tidings indeed was that Boromir was immediately thinking about it as good news, a chance to find and use the ring now. While I agree that this reading works well with Elrond's response, I don't think it's the only reading that works. We learn a lot about Boromir's relationship with Faramir and Denethor later, and it seems to me that Boromir would tend to espouse his father's beliefs. Is it not possible that, upon hearing the information from Elrond, Boromir looks on Isildur with derision? After all, Denethor will later look down on Aragorn because he is of the line of Isildur. Arvedui, of the line of Isildur, attempted to claim the kingship and was rejected. Isildur's bane was mentioned in the dream, so the Great Ones in Gondor have likely been discussing Isildur over the past year, and maybe not in the most positive way. Denethor will also later say that to use the ring is perilous. I believe that Denethor, and so most likely Boromir, would consider Isildur's decision to take the ring instead of easily destroying it after the defeat of Sauron to be foolish. So I think it is quite possible that Boromir's exclamation is genuinely one of disappointment, and even derision. And the statement from Elrond that follows can be taken at face value, in agreement with the sentiments of Boromir. Of course, Boromir thinks it better to destroy the enemy's ring, assuming that it could be easily destroyed. If Boromir had been in Isildur's place, of course he would have destroyed it. But my situation is very different from that of Isildur. My people have waned, while Sauron is only growing stronger. To destroy the ring now would be nearly impossible. To win without the ring would also be impossible. Our only hope is to use it, and so on. Um, now, I think this is a really interesting reading that does a good job of... Uh, Basically, see, I mean, the, the, obviously, this is a ring. This is this is a ring. This is a reading which is consistent with some temptation from Boromir, right? Which sets him up for the temptation uh, that he is going to, uh, that he's going to receive later on, right? That he's going to give into at least briefly later on. Um, so I think that's that's good, and I think that that works. There are a couple things though that I would there. I'm not 100% convinced by this reading, and that for two different reasons. First, I don't think it's quite safe to say that Denethor, and therefore, like, you know, 
folks in Minas Tirith in general um, look upon Isildur with derision, right? Derision seems a lot. It's true Denethor is going to make that crack that the line of Isildur is a, uh, you know, is like long bereft of dignity, right? Um, still he comes but from the line of Isildur, right? Um, yes, but that doesn't seem to me to contain any specific derision for Isildur himself, right? What he's saying is that basically the descendants of Isildur, um, the descendants of Isildur are merely uh, the, the, you know, uh, are now just vagabonds in the wilderness, right? They have decreased to the point where they have, they are of no note, right? If he's being snobby there, right? Um, he is not, I think, being snobby, like being like pro Anarian and anti Isildur or something like that, but rather, look, you've got the Northern Line and you've got the Southern Line, right? And the Northern Line, maybe it's still around, right? Perhaps it's true that you know, the father-son line all the way back to Isildur has remained unbroken. But come on, at the end of the day, so what? Right? So what? So, you know, and like, where are they now? Who are they now? Right? Look at Gondor. Right? Gondor at least is still in business. Right? Look at Minas Tirith. Like, sure, it's not what it used to be. Right? Minas Tirith isn't what it used to be. Gondor isn't what it used to be. Right? I mean, Minas Tirith was only one of the three cities of Gondor, and now it's, it's the last one left, and even it is kind of on the wane. But still, right? I mean, the, we have maintained some of the dignity and authority of, you know, our Numenorean past. What's going on up there in the north? Nothing is going on in the north, right? Who are those guys? Nobody. Are they descended from Isildur? Yeah, but who cares, right? Um, so they're just, so the descendants of Isildur are vagabonds living in the wilderness, right? Um, you know, then uh, that, uh, right. Uh, the last of a, of a, of a yes, uh, exactly. So I don't, I don't think that his disdain for, uh, even if we can get over the fact that he has, he could be fronting there, right? I mean, he's resisting Aragorn. He doesn't want any part of Aragorn's return. Um, and so, of course, he's going to say that, right? I don't think that necessarily means uh, that he would have held that opinion five years ago of the line of Isildur or whatever, or 50 years ago, like when he was a kid or something like that, or that his father would have, or even that of like, uh, I mean, it's cause it's quite clear that, um, uh, Imrahil does not right. Share his views on that point. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm not sure we can totally take it at face value and I'm less, even less sure, uh, that we can take it, um, as a sign of his assessment of a Sildor personally, right? Uh, so uh, that that piece of that that line, and let's all also admit that Denethor is not exactly in the most uh, uh, positive and constructive headspace at the moment when he says that line, right? So again, that hardly seems like a piece of. Uh, you know, a window into the stable lore of Gondor, right? Or like the cultural opinion of uh, uh, the man on the street in Gondor there. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, Angris, Boromir does not know who Aragorn is yet, and we're, we're coming to that. I, I think that's going to be an interesting... It's some, something I want to talk about as we move forward today, but we'll get back to that. Um, and yes, Tony, I do... Does he does he know that Aragorn is Throngil? He might, right? I would think yes, because he's probably seen him in the Palantir, in which case he probably recognized him. And he's like, oh, are you kidding me? Like, he's that scrub Throngil of all that, right? Yeah, I mean, so Denethor, again, lots of beef, much of it personal rather than political and certainly rather than historical. So, um... Anyway, I don't, um, I don't really think that 
as I say, I don't think we can take that as as like uh, an indicator. The other indicator uh, that Blau the Inspirer points to is the rejection of Arvedui. And again, there we have some special pleading, right? Um, remember that um, Arnil had been acclaimed, right? He was the victor of the battle and he had been acclaimed as King of Gondor. And then Arvedui comes in with this claim. So we're talking about somebody who is being offered the kingship in the south, right? And he, Arnil, would have had to be like, oh, yeah, actually, no, never mind, I'm good, right? Yeah, that guy who lives like a couple thousand miles away and doesn't know almost anything about us, right? And who can't really help us. Indeed, he can barely keep his own kingdom afloat, right? Um, yeah, yeah, let's take him as our king. Uh, what even does that mean, right? So there's so much more with the sort of the politics of that particular moment, which again, it's hard for me to see that as the Southern Kingdom cast, casting aspersions on Isildur personally or on his memory personally, right? That there's, it's a political situation. And, um, and a, 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 remember that even the prediction, even what Malba the Seer says to Arvedui, um, suggests that the Gondorians accepting Arvedui as king is going to look unlikely, right? That this 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 is not going to seem like the smart move. It is going to be the smart... I mean, the implication that Malbeth the Seer... of Malbeth the Seer's words it, are, are that it's going to be, in fact, to the benefit of Gondor. It would have been better had they done... had they accepted him, as we see, of course, in the next generation, it is going to be Aarnor, and he's the last king of Gondor. So... That, you know, long term, the whole Arnil situation didn't turn out well, right? Didn't turn out right. We don't know what would have happened, right? Had they accepted our Vegui, Malbut the Seer implies it would have been good, right? Even though we don't know how, and even though, and again, I stress this is the most important element for the sake of this discussion, it didn't look good at the time. There's every, apart from the the personal politics, right, of people, especially Arnil and his supporters down in Gondor, so even, even, even if you disregard the people that you're asking essentially to abdicate, right, their own claim to the throne, um, to, 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 to whom in Gondor would that have looked like a good idea, right? It's a completely counterintuitive move on their part. And again, we're told that it, um, you know, it would have been good if it happened. But again, we don't even know how it would have been good um, if it had, uh, if it had happened. Um, so, um, yeah, and Tony, I agree. Arno is very diplomatic about it, right? He doesn't look like a jerk uh, in, uh, in maintaining his own throne. But anyway, so, so again, does that mean that Isildur has a bad reputation, right? That they look down on Isildur. That that again, I don't, I can't see that as they might, but I can't see that as evidence for it, right? And counter to this, we have the evidence of things like the Argonath, right, which suggests that Isildur still fairly prominent in the cultural mythology of Gondor, right? Um, so. And then even if you consider the, the, the immediate role of Isildur in the founding of Gondor, right? Boromir's about to mention this fairly soon, um, that, um, uh, that how he came to Minas Tirith with Minelda and dwelt with him there for a while, you know, he was like the personal mentor, Right of the first of the line of the Gondorian kings, uh, and then went off to the north, right to um, uh, to return to his own realm, but to remain high king of all of Gondor and Arnor. Um, uh, so, so yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, Tony, exactly. The Argonath uh, would have been built after Isildur's death. That's my point. Right, is that. In the generations after Isildur's death, they were still building megalithic statues of him, right? Um, right alongside Anarion, um, with no obvious preference for the one over the other. Uh, so, um, anyway, I, 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 I don't think... 
I don't think there's strong evidence to suggest that Isildur's reputation in the South is low. Um, so my objection to this reading is essentially on two points, right? On two levels. Uh, the first is that I'm, I'm not hundred percent convinced that that is Denethor's opinion, that Denethor thinks ill of Isildur in that way. And secondly, I'm also not a hundred percent convinced that Boromir would necessarily share Denethor's outlook. Um, he might do, uh, but Hmm, how can we say this politely? Denethor's a lot smarter than Boromir, right? And much wiser. Boromir is his dad's favorite son, but Boromir is not his dad's favorite son because he is like his father. He seems to be his father's favorite son largely because he is not like his father. Denethor has a son who is a, ver a great deal like him in mind and mood uh, and talent, and that is Faramir, right? Gandalf makes that very clear. Um, and that seems to be... Uh, and, and let me just say, I don't find that hard to understand. That actually seems to me a very insightful uh, move on Tolkien's part. Um, uh that Denethor would be harsher with the kid who is like him makes sense to me. Works for me. Um, so, you know, Boromir, how, how, how alike are Boromir's views to Denethor's? He certainly does not have his father's wisdom. Um, so while I, I do like the line of reasoning that Blood the Inspirer suggests here uh, for how Boromir could go from this into temptation, again, I think it works, right? Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm not sure that he would necessarily begin at the same place. Yes, Denethor is going to say to use the ring is perilous. Does that mean Boromir gets that? Does that mean that Boromir... Um, I don't even think that... All right, I'll go one step further. Denethor seems to know about the ring, like in general, right? He seems to know that the ring A exists, right? And some, and B, some things about it. Right. This those speeches that he makes in that conversation with Gandalf, which Blot is quoting there, um, show that he he kind of knows about the ring and what it is. Right. Um, I'm not sure that either Faramir or Boromir know as much as he does about the ring. Um, Faramir seems slower to leap to the conclusion of what Frodo's trying to hide than I suspect Denethor would be. And I don't... And he's the studious one of the two, right? Um, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway... Um, I So I think it is possible that Boromir is speaking slightingly of his I don't think that this reading is impossible. I do think that it I do think that it where it passes the first test, right? Which is does it work? Yes, yes. I do think that it does work. Um but I am not it doesn't pass the other tests for me. It doesn't f I don't see it's 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 counterintuitive, right? All of the superficial evidence that we have, but things like the Argonath, right, suggest that Isildur is one of the great heroes in Gondor as well as in the north, right? This is the son of Elendil the Tall, for crying out loud, right? Um, the founder of Minas Ithil, the sister city of Minas Anor, right? Um, all of the superficial, our superficial assumptions would, would have to be, therefore, that Isildur, in as much as he is remembered, is revered by the people of Gondor as Elendil surely is, right? Um, think of the white tree, 
right? Still the symbol of Gondor um, and its connection with Isildur, not only back in Numenor, Tony, as you're pointing out, but of course, the you know, how it was planted by Isildur there in Minas Anor in memory of Anarion, as clearly Boromir knows, right? That's obviously lore he here. Anyway, again, all the superficial cultural indicators would seem to suggest that Isildur is revered in the South. Therefore, in order for us to hold this reading, right, that uh, Boromir's reaction to Isildur and Isildur's action is essentially negative, um, we would need some reason to doubt those things. I, I, I would want some concrete evidence, and I, I'm not seeing enough of it to really uh, convince me there. Um, anyway, okay. But this was, but still, I thought this was a really, uh, a really good point and really, really interesting. Um, okay. Let's get back to the text. Only to the north did these tidings come, and only to a few. Small wonder is it that you have not heard them, Boromir. From the ruin of the Gladden Fields, where Isildur perished, three men only came back over the mountains after long wandering. One of these was Octar, the esquire of Isildur, who bore the shards of the sword of Elendil. And he brought them to Velandil, heir of Isildur, who, being but a child, had remained here in Rivendell. But Narsil was broken, and its light extinguished, and it has not been yet been reforged. Sorry. And it has not yet been forged again. Fruitless did I call the victory of the last alliance? Not wholly so, yet it did not achieve its end. Sauron was diminished, but not destroyed. His ring was lost, but not unmade. The dark tower was broken, but its foundations were not removed, for they were made with the power of the ring, and while it remains, they will endure. Many elves and many mighty men and many of their friends had perished in the war. Anarion was slain, and Isildur was slain, and Gilgalad and Elendil were no more. Never again shall there be any such league of elves and men, for men multiply and the firstborn decrease, and the two kindreds are estranged. And ever since that day, the race of Numenor has decayed, and the span of their years has lessened. Okay. Um, I remember when I was still young in my Tolkien reading, not to mention just young, uh, that as a kid I had the vague impression that Velandil was... Like that when Octar returns with the shards of Narsil to Velandil, the child, right? That like Velandil then goes out to seek his fortune. Like I kind of imagined him in the mold of Aragorn, right? Um, that is to say, in my mind, I completely skipped over the whole period of the northern realm of Gondor. And I remember when I fight, because I didn't, I didn't start. I don't remember when I started reading the appendices, but I didn't dig into the appendices f until I was a teenager, at least. Um, and anyway, I, uh, I remember when I like figured out that, yeah, Elendil had already established Enuminous, like he had a city and a capital. He already had a kingdom going up there in the north, right? So in Velandil, because I because th the image that I had of Velandil being harbored was like, you know, everyone else has gone and Velandil only has remained, right? Where that's, that's clearly, clearly not the case, right? It's clearly not the case because, again, the whole, like the whole Enuminous city and civilization already exists, which of course then leads to the question, so why, why didn't they leave him back home in Enuminous, right? Um, and my answer to that question is pretty simple. They didn't leave him at home in, in Enuminous in case they lost, I assume, 
right? Because Elendil had marched with his whole army out so that, the I mean, almost all of the fighting force of Arnor has gone out uh, to war with Elendil, right? So Anumanus is not well defended at this point. Now, it's pretty far off the front lines, right? But remember, if the last alliance fails... The failure of the last alliance would be kind of a doomsday situation, right? If Gilgalad and Elendil and all of their followers go down, who's left? And Sauron wins? Who's left? Right? Sauron is going to roll over everybody else, right? And certainly the survivors of Arnor are not going to be able to do anything. So the best hope for the survival of his one last son and the sole surviving heir of Elendil at that point would be in Rivendell, right? Um, Kurtzimus asks a fascinating question. I wonder if they called it the last alliance at the time. You know, Kurtzimus, I wouldn't be shocked if they had, actually. Um, if they had known, essentially, that this was um, the last such alliance, surely Gilgalad and the Noldor would have known that their time was running out, right? Um, so that the idea of such a thing happening again, even whether they won or lost, um, that this would be the last such alliance, um, it seems to me not impossible that they would have had that understanding as they marched off uh, to war. Um, but, um, yeah, I agree, uh, uh, Galandar, the Dunedain would have become rangers a lot sooner if the last alliance had failed. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, Matt, you're right. There were more losses against Dark Lords in the past than there had been victories like that of the last alliance. Exactly. I mean... They have more reason to think they're marching off to a Nirnarth or Noidiad than they have to think that they're marching off to a breaking of Thangaradrim, right? I mean, those are the models. And yes, the first is a good deal more likely than the second. Um, yeah, so... Um, anyhow, I... Uh, it makes all kinds of sense. Even if there still is a thriving, you know populated city of Anuminus, uh, you know, across the wilderness, that he would still uh, leave Velandil. Um, also, remember, Rivendell is a substantial percentage of his march on, right? He's left Anuminus a long time ago. So, it's not a question of him leaving Velandil behind, it's a question of him dropping Velandil off on the way, right? So, he marches out of Anuminus with all of his sons, Right? Isildur does. I'm forgetting. I'm blanking. Does he have three or four sons? I think he has three who die. Right? Yeah. Three who die and Velandil's the fourth. That's what I was, that's what I was thinking. I'm just sorry, suddenly doubting my memory there. Um, right. So he marches out with all four of his sons along with Grandpa Elendil. Right? And when they get to Rivendell, he leaves his youngest behind at that point, right? I I wonder, did he even was that even the plan? It might not even have been the plan, right? Isildur might have been like, all right, everybody, come on. It's all good, right? Hop in the wagon. We're, we're going down, you know, to war. And maybe there was a thing, you know, maybe this um, uh, this maybe a discussion happened when they were here, right? Perhaps someone had some foreseeing, perhaps, uh, you know, Gilgalad and Elrond and Gorfindel were talking about it and were like, you know what, actually would be probably a good idea. Let's leave somebody of the line of Elendil here, right? Let's not have everybody go. Um, so, so yes. Now, uh, Tony, I don't know exactly the answer to that question. How is Rivendell protected at the time without Vilya? Uh, with, that is, without the power of the ring. Um, not only is Elrond not wearing it, Kurtzimus, he doesn't own it yet. Um, uh, that is, it's still Gilgalad's ring at that point. Uh, so, it's, it's still secret, 
right? Um, it would have been protected at least like, uh, I mean, basically the idea for, um, uh, the idea for, uh, um, Rivendell is something like, it reminds me of Nargothrond more than anywhere else. It's, it's slightly Gondolin-esque, right? And of course it's connected with Gondolin from the Hobbit and onwards, right? Um, uh, so it's, it's slightly Gondolin-esque, but it reminds me a little bit more of Nargothrond because it's not quite as completely hidden. You don't have to find a hidden tunnel to get there, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, and, and anyway, don't forget that uh, there are more powers that the elves have than just the three rings, right? Um, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's secrecy and the strength of those who are there. El Elrond, of course, does not stay. Um, but uh, anyhow... Uh, yeah, and you do have some pretty big names protecting it, Gilgonthir, I agree. Um, so, and Matt, absolutely, leaving the youngest prince behind is good statesmanship. The heir and the, the, heir and the spare is a constant for leadership, to the point we have designated survivors in democracies. You can't put all the, oil, the, all the royal eggs in one basket. Right, and, and I don't know, was Isildur planning to? You know, what, was it his plan all along to drop Volando off at Rivendell? It might have been, right? He and Olendil might have talked about this, and they decided, okay, let's 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 leave Volando behind. And Volando was upset about it, right? Um, uh, or maybe, again, maybe it was a decision that was made all along the journey after they met Gilgalad, right? I don't really know. Um, I think that could kind of work um, work either way. But uh, but anyway, as I said, I I. I I know as a kid, I kind of imagined Volandil growing up like uh, Aragorn growing up, you know, with Gilrine um, uh, into, uh, uh, you know, like in, in Rivendell and then kind of going off into the wilderness, right? But of course, that's not what happened. Volandil, uh, you know, we don't know how long he stays in Rivendell, but he then goes back to Inuminus and rebuilds, you know, you know, after the death of pretty much everybody, right? Only three of all of everybody, of all the, 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 the people who marched forth with Elendil, only three returned to the north. That is incredible. That is incredibly devastating. I mean, you know, we talk about like, you know, the lost generation, you know, uh, uh, like in England, right? Of uh, Tolkien's generation, right? People who, you know, how many were killed in World War One. <laughs> How about that for casualty rate, right? Uh, like 99.8% of all of the people who, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? An entire generation, possibly more than one generation um, of uh, the, you know, all of the greatest of, uh, of the Numenorean uh, survivors and, uh, and allies there go away and, um, uh, it's gone. All of them gone, except three. Um, yeah, yeah. And you're right, go, go gone through mass casualties on a scale that would have been unthinkable in that world. Absolutely. It's, it's, that doesn't happen uh, on these kinds of battlefields. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lincoln says, how many historical armies that lost had casualties that bad? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, and so Tarlonio, you're right. It is kind of like a near knight or no idiot, right? Or that is the outcome of the Battle of the Last Alliance for the people of the North, for the Arnorians, was like the the results for the people of Hithlum of the near knight or no idiot, right? Um, the Feanorians, many of them survive, right? Uh, Turgon and and many of his people escape. But the men of Hithlum get killed almost to a man. Um, and the same is true. The Arnorians, the entire army of Elendil gets killed almost to a man. Right. Um, so, yeah. Trifle, I agree. Gondolin. Gondolin is, is uh, a pretty serious slaughter. Right. Because they're trapped. Right. And can't escape. Um, but still... 
to our individual still do manage to lead more than three people out, right? So even that at the end of the day is still is still not quite a comparison. Anyway, um, the um, uh, the point is, um, I think it's it's um, we can see why Valandil was left not back in Arnor, but here uh, in in Rivendell. Um, but let's look at this first paragraph, sort of step back a bit from this first paragraph. Why? 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 Why is Elrond saying this? Why is Elrond saying this? Only to the north did these tidings come, and only to a few. Right. So he's going, hang on a second. If I need to, uh, let me scroll forward. I've been archiving my passages at the end so I can go back. Right. This is what Elrond had just been saying. Right. Um, the, reacting to the, this is, that is tidings indeed. Right. That Isildur had it. Right. Soon he was betrayed by it to his death. And so it is named in the north Isildur's bane. Yet death maybe was better than what else might have befallen him. So you're Elrond now, right? Where are you going with this? What are you talking about? Only to the north did these tidings come. So he's explaining in part, why is it that nobody in the south knows this? Right? Well, because Isildur's army was almost, com that is, at the Gladden Fields, was wiped out almost to a man. Right? Only three survived, and they all came to the north. None of them returned to the south. Right? Um, okay. Right? So that explains how Boromir doesn't know. Right? So is he explaining this to Boromir? Uh, I... I Yeah, that's interesting, Luke. Yes, I had forgotten about that in Unfinished Tales. In Unfinished Tales, it's interesting because you can see it's it's a it's a discussion for another time. I'm interested in the kinds of revisions that Tolkien makes. This is true of a lot of them. This is what I love about Unfinished Tales. Um is not just the things that we get extra information about, but the things that we can see Tolkien rethinking, right? Um, but um, anyway, I, I'm really interested in this. I had forgotten about that. I had forgotten that actually he did suggest that there was a portion of the army that survived. They got sent ahead uh, north, and so that Isildur was only coming with a small number of people, right? Um for the Gladden. So that the disaster of the Gladden Fields was not the loss of the entire army, but was instead uh, the loss only of a few. There's no hint that that's the case here, right? In fact, what Tolkien says there in Unfinished Tales could arguably be said to be in contradiction to this paragraph, right? Now, again, technically it isn't. From the ruin of the Gladden Fields, three men only came ever back over the mountains after long, long wandering, right? So technically, yes. Others had come back, you know, uh, before that, but but from the disaster of the Gladden Fields, uh, the, the, again, it, it fits. Tolkien is an awesome retconner, right? And it fits. Um, but uh, that doesn't... Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, that d I, I don't see any reason to think that that had been the case. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, like I say, I, I love Unfinished Tales, uh, and I'm really interested to see the things that Tolkien is thinking through and the how he handles Isildur after the full development of the story of the ring in The Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, remember, when the Council of Elrond is being written, he still has only the vaguest idea of what comes after this, right? Um, so... Yeah, and again, he comes back and revises it afterwards, but a lot of what's here was there in the original drafts. Uh, so coming back to the story of Isildur and fleshing that out after he's finished The Lord of the Rings is a really interesting project, which I find really fascinating. But anyway, anyway. My question, though, why is Elendil talking about this? Why is Elendil talking about 
Octar the Esquire of Isildur, who bore the shards of the sword of Elendil, and he brought them to Velandil, the heir of Isildur, who being but a child had remained here in Rivendell. Why do we need to know that? But Narsa was broken and its light extinguished and it has not yet been forged again. Right. Yeah, Tom. He's establishing the provenance of the of the sword. Yes. Um, exactly. Uh, it has not yet been forged again. It's due to be forged again on Tuesday, right? Uh, it's kind of like the, the implication here. Um, it sounds to me in this paragraph like he is deliberately setting up the reveal that is coming. He's not doing the reveal, right? But he is setting it up. He's drawing everyone around the table's attention to two important things, right? One... Uh, the line of, Is of Isildur did not fail, right? He had a son who survived and was here, right? And two, the shards of Elendil's sword also survived and were passed on to that heir, right? Um, these are two points that are going to be very important in a few minutes, Right. That is a few minutes in Council of Elrond time, um, not in our time, <laughs> in a couple weeks in our time, most likely. Um, but. Um, uh, but this is not just he's not just giving a history lesson here. Right. Elrond talks for quite a while, and so it's tempting to see him as just kind of bloviating. Right. Like he's just sort of digressing and 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 given a whole bunch of exposition here, right? But one of the things that has impressed me most in our, our first six sessions here on the Council of Elrond so far has been that Elrond seems actually to be very strategic about what he brings up and what he emphasizes, right? Um, I agree, Tom, that uh, Elrond does know something about Boromir and why he's, why he's here, right? Because, of course, there's one person around the table in particular for whom this is going to be really important to hear, right? Um, Elrond has to know who Boromir is. I cannot believe that Elrond doesn't know who... He's not introduced him by title, right? But I cannot believe that Elrond does not know who Boromir is, right? He also knows, Elrond also knows, that the public revelation of Aragorn as the heir of Elendil and bearer of the sword that was broken is coming out today. That's on the agenda. That's clearly on Elrond's agenda, right? He knows this because the time has come, right? Isildur's bane has been revealed, right? That, that, that he and Aragorn both, they've had this conversation years ago, right? Um, they know that things are coming to a head. And this is the next step. So, on the agenda today for the Council of Elrond is to reveal Aragorn's lineage, right? Um, and the significance of this moment, right? Um, so he's setting it up. He's setting it up, giving this otherwise not really crucial information. Right. We don't need to know this in order to understand the history of the War of the Ring. Um, but we're going to need to know this. But in particular, there is somebody now. And this remember, this was not in the plan. He probably had the agenda made up, you know, in advance. Right. Like Elrond strikes me as an advanced planning kind of dude. Right. I bet you he had the agenda for the Council of Elrond prepared prior to that morning. Right. And then that morning... Boromir's other. So here he's got he's got his agenda. I'm gonna so okay, unveil the heir of Elendil. And then oh the son of the steward of Gondor shows up that morning. Okay, so that's interesting, isn't it? Um, um 
uh, yeah. So um, we have we have a situation potentially, right? And I have got to think that he's he. I mean, he he clearly knows. He clearly knows. There are a couple ways in which the Council of Elrond could go badly, right? There are a few negative outcomes possible here. And when Boromir shows up, there's, there's a new one or two, right, that are now sort of on the table. Um, yeah, and Flamifer, I agree. Although uh, Elrond had the agenda prepared, I agree with you that he did not review it with the participants at the start of the meeting. No, I don't think he circulated copies of the agenda. I think, uh, I think that this was a closed agenda. He knows where he's going. He's probably talked it over with Gandalf. But apart from Elrond and Gandalf and possibly Aragorn, I, I don't think anybody else knows the agenda. Um, but anyway, here's Boromir. So now he's got to, so imagine Boromir's not there. Boromir doesn't show up, right? And we get the Council of Elrond sans Boromir. So we've got, you know, the elves who are there. We've got Glowen. We've got Legolas. We've got uh, the hobbits, right? Bilbo and Frodo. We've got Gandalf. That's who's at the Council of Elrond. The reveal about the heir of, of Elendil and what this means and that the sword will be re and the declaration that the sword of Elendil is going to be reforged and is going to set forth. That's cool. That's still big news, still an important agenda item, but it's not controversy, right? I mean, who's going to object? Who's going to resist? Who's going to be like, prove it, man. Right? Like you, uh, Howard, you know, like, who, who are you to say that this schmo over there is the heir of Elendil? Who's going to challenge it? Nobody. Oh, what, is Glowen going to challenge it? Is Legolas going to challenge it? No, right? Now Boromir's there, right? And so now there is some pressure, right? There is some pressure to prove. Um, pressure on both of them. Pressure on Elrond, pressure on Aragorn, right? Especially on Aragorn to justify this claim. Right. Um, because it, this is now a whole new kettle of fish. Right. And I suspect that this is one of the reasons why Elrond is dwelling on the Gondorian situation in the way that he is. Right. By telling this story in the context of, you know, remember, he's Mr. Eyewitness. Right. Saying, let me give you this skinny about what really happened at the Battle of the Last Alliance, because P.S. I was there and I saw this stuff happening. Right. Oh, and P.S., I was also here back in Rivendell when the Shards of Narsil showed up, right? After the disaster of the Gladden Field. One of the only survivors of the disasters. Of the I personally interviewed him, right? And saw him bearing the Shards of Narsil and saw them handed over to Volandil. So I can, just, I can tell you that. So again, he's setting all of this up so that when Aragorn stands up and makes his, um, and makes his statement, right? When Aragorn is going to declare himself, the groundwork has been laid, right? And Boromir now, if he's going to question it, if he's going to challenge it, he has to challenge Elrond. And Elrond is way establishing his bona fides, right? He is way establishing his authority and therefore the authority of Aragorn moving forward. Um, uh, Tony, I absolutely agree that this shows that Elrond is very much on Team Aragorn. Absolutely. This pari I, I, I don't see... This paragraph itself seems to me almost 100% focused on setting up Aragorn later on. He is uh, absolutely laying the groundwork for what Aragorn is going to do. Um... Uh... Yeah, and so, Rococo, you're absolutely right. There's nothing that Boromir could say, right? That's exactly what Elrond has preempted. What if Elrond hadn't done this, right? If Elrond had not said any of this stuff, if he'd just been like, oh, yeah, Isildur should have thrown away the ring. Anyway, yeah, so, um, uh, 
I, but now I'm going to hand things over to, uh, but he didn't destroy the ring. So let's move on and see what else needs to be talked about. Aragorn, you have something to say, right? And then Aragorn is like, oh, so <clears throat> actually I'm the heir of Elendil and this is the sword of Elendil right here. Now Aragorn, or, uh, sorry, Boromir could challenge that, right? Boromir totally be like, ooh, the heck are you, right? You're it, it, just like a scruffy looking ranger, right? Uh, with a broken sword. And then, you know, Elrond being, oh, oh, by the way, yeah, did I mention? No, I can totally vouch. That's absolutely the right sword, right? I mean, but by doing it in advance, now Boromir can't challenge it, can't really do a frontal challenge of Aragorn's claim because Elrond has preemptively put it beyond dispute. Um, and that, I think, is a fa I'd never really noticed this before when i'm whenever i'm just kind of listening through the council of elrond i always like i just kind of get wrapped up in the the flow of history right and um um and you know it all it all is kind of like i'm, I'm just like uh getting lore right I, i've you know listening to listening to um uh to elrond reveal lore right um but of course, there's another really cunning way, in, or rather another opportunity, that Elrond seems to be, um, that Elrond seems to be taking advantage of, right? There is a second reason why Boromir, I think, is the primary target of this speech, of this paragraph. Right. Not only because he's setting Boromir up to receive Aragorn's revelation in just a little bit, but it's also directly related to Boromir's quest. Boromir has no doubt already recited the rhyme for Elrond. Right. I can't imagine when he shows up after his journey of 110 days and, you know, is taken to see Master Elrond of Imladris, right, that he comes in and he's like, OK, I've been waiting a long time and I still remember the poem. And here's how it goes. Uh, tell me what it means, dude. And Elrond doubtless says, I'm not going to tell you right now, but come to the council and everything will be made clear to you. Right. So here's Boromir waiting for the answer to his real seek for the sword that was broken is the first line of the poem that he came up with. Right. So in addition to setting up Aragorn, Elrond is also offering a teaser and again saying to Boromir, I got your answer. Right. You're going to know what that poem means. Seek for the sword that was broken. The shards of the sword of Elendil, and he brought them to Velandil, the heir of Isildur, who, being but a child, had remained here in Rivendell. But Narsil was broken, and its light extinguished, and it has not yet been forged again. And that, Boromir, if you're paying attention, is the explanation of line one of your poem. What is the sword that was broken? Elendil's sword is the sword that was broken. Okay, so so Boromir, if you're following along, you have half of the explanation of line one. The other half, of course, is why should we seek the sword that was broken? Right? Okay, if that's the broke, given that that's the broken sword, right? Why do we seek it? And that is the answer he's going to get very soon, right? Um, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, um. Yeah, spiritual cushions. What is the light of Narsil? Did it glow or something? Sounds like it. It's light extinguished. Sounds like it used to glow. This is known, right? We have seen glowy swords uh, before. Um, Narsil seems to have... I, I, I mean, that could be taken purely metaphorically, right? Totally figuratively. Um, but I don't see any reason not to take that literally as well. Um, uh, that Narsil was shiny, like, you know, Glamdring is shiny, though differently, seems to me. I mean, shiny swords are a thing. Uh, we've had that long since. So, um, and yes, we will get some radiance from Andoral after its reforged trifle. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Okay. Uh, 
No, you're right, Mad, Mad Violinist, that it is a dwarf wrought blade. It doesn't have the same problem. I'm not trying to say it's the same, obviously, as Glam Drink. It like, glows blue in the presence of orcs or anything like that. Um, it's not the same. I'm just saying that a s magic sword which shines with light is far from unknown. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um... <laughs> Rococo says Narso glows in the presence of Elendil so like all the time yeah maybe maybe um, anyhow okay um, let's see okay let's keep uh, to, so the second paragraph um, fruitless did I call the victory of the last alliance not wholly so yet it did not achieve its end um this second paragraph is all about hindsight, I would emphasize. Um, Sauron was diminished, but not destroyed. His ring was lost, but not unmade. The Dark Tower was broken, but its foundations were not removed, for they were made with the power of the ring, and while it remains, they will endure. Um... I saw there was a there was a long discussion uh, on the questions board about this question, like how much did they know and how did the argument between Elrond and Isildur go? Um, I would definitely agree with some, and lots of people were saying different things. So I, there's too much there for me to summarize, but um, but I would pitch in with something that several people were saying, which is we do need to remember that uh, there is a lot that is not known um, and much that remember they have very little clear information about the one ring right Celebrimbor figured out that it was bad news right um, and could exert power over the three rings probably but what else did he know about it what it's what, you know so like now now, in retrospect, it's clear that the Dark Tower was broken, but its foundations were not removed, for they were made with the power of the ring, and while it remains, they will endure. That, by the way, is still probably not empirically proven, right? That, I believe, Elrond is espousing a theory there, because they have seen how the foundations of Barad-dûr have survived, right? And so it is now, in retrospect, a logical conclusion um, that the One Ring is the root of Sauron's power, that's not... That can't have been obvious. I doubt even Celebrimbor absolutely knew that. <laughs> Were they literal foundations or spiritual foundations? Elrond suggests both, right? I don't think we're talking about the cunning masonry of the foundations, which is only enabled by the One Ring, right? Um, yes. Are there are the foundations to Barad-dûr partially spiritual? Yes, I think that, or even, or even metaphorical. I'm not convinced. Tony is wondering if is is he talking about the power, you know, of the tower? I mean, it, 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 he could in talking about the foundations of Baradur, he could be speaking even sort of figuratively about the authority and power of Sauron in Middle-earth. Um, but anyway, I, 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 yes, I mean, that seems to be fairly clear. But again, they didn't know this, right? They can't have known this. One of the ways in which they have drawn the conclusions that they have about the Ring of Power is by looking at what happened in the meantime. Seeing Sauron diminished the way that he was after the Battle of Daggerlad, but seeing him grow again. The significance of the One Ring, how integral, integrally the One Ring is connected to Sauron's power has to be a conclusion that they have drawn after the fact. They can't have known that when Gogo Adon Elendil set out. They can't have known that. They knew the One Ring was powerful, they knew it was a threat, right? But did they know, they would not have, would they know its corruptive influence? I can't think they would, 
right? Isildur is literally the first person to be corrupted by the temptation of the ring, right? How would they know that it would have that impact on people, right? Um, how, did, how would they know that it would do anything when it was taken, right? Certainly, it, it, we, we, we know for a fact. Yeah, I think we can say that we know for at least pretty close to a fact that um, Elendil, or sorry, Elrond never saw Isildur put it on, right? And we know this because we know the ring was piping hot. It burned his hand, right? Um, so we know he didn't put it on because it was like white hot. You don't put a white hot ring on your finger. It, he burned himself even just touching it. So while when he first was like in that first, you know, hour of Isildur's possession of the ring, he wasn't wearing it and trying it out and performing experiments. He was like, ah, woo, wah, you know, bouncing it from hand to hand and putting it in a pouch and hoping it doesn't burn through, right? I mean, that's what Isildur was busy doing at the time. Um, so, uh, so no, so he didn't try it on. Elendo, so anyway, nobody knows what it will do, what it can do in the hands of anybody other than Sauron, because it's never been in anybody else's hands. Nobody knows what's going to happen to Sauron if he's separated from the ring, because he's never been separated from the ring except when he was to go to Numenor, but nobody knew about that, and never mind. Um, it's, it's... They don't know any of those things, right? These are conclusions. Sauron was diminished, but not destroyed. <laughs> exactly. JJ says, I will take this as we're down. Oh, water, water. Yeah, exactly. The speech would probably not have gone like that. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, good. Flammifer says, if the Numenorians had known about the power of the One Ring, surely they would have insisted that he hand it over when he surrendered to them. Yeah, you got to think our Farazon would have would have wanted a piece of that. Absolutely. Um yeah, so, um, yeah. They have almost no information, right? Did they even know that Sauron wasn't gone? Sauron was diminished but not destroyed. Did they know that at the time? It looked like he was destroyed, right? I bet they were entertaining the pleasant possibility that Sauron had been destroyed, right? I mean, why wouldn't they? The destruction of the ring. So, I mean, did they even know? What reason did they have to believe that if the ring were not also destroyed, Sauron would remain and return? I see. I don't think they knew that. How could they know that? Um, how could they even theorize about that? Um, the destruction of the ring. I mean, doubtless they knew it was bad news, right? I mean. It's an evil thing made by the enemy. They don't know what effect it's going to have on other people. They don't know if anybody else can even use it or what it would do to them. But, you know, a better safe than sorry move would be to destroy it, right? Um, so, um, so, yeah, Tony, I agree. They might not even know how, you know, physical, the effect of physical death uh, on somebody like Sauron. Like, yeah, what's even possible? What happened? Um yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's very plausible that without Sauron, it would have no power for evil. Yeah, because again, the idea that Sauron placed a large portion of his own evil will into the ring. Did they know that? How did they know that? Right? They couldn't know that. Um, they've only figured it out afterwards. Right? Um, so, so, yes, these statements were not things that... So I, I don't believe that Elrond winds his way home from Daggerlad, dejectedly saying to himself, well, we didn't achieve our end. Sauron was diminished but not destroyed. The ring is lost but not unmade, or about to be lost. The dark tower is broken, but its foundations are not removed. No. I think they're like, well, that was costly, but... We won. So everything's okay, right? Everything's fine now? Yeah? Right? Um, keep in mind... Um, keep in mind that... Again, there's so many things that we assume people knew that 
like people reading the Lord of the Rings assume that people knew in advance, right? Which was not even information available to them, right? Not only did people not know for sure that the Ring of Power was in circulation out there in riverbanks and under mountains, um, but like what it was and that it was a big deal. And I mean, there's so many things about it. Um, yeah. Now, Mad Violinist, you're right. Um, Elrond did attempt to persuade Isildur to destroy the ring. Um, and at the very least, I think that uh, the very least argument for destroying the ring would be a better safe than sorry thing. Right. Um, uh, they did know Chris, that the Ring of Power was made in order to enable Sauron to wield dominion over the Three Rings, right? At the very least, at the very least, having somebody still having it, it's got to be, at the very least, it's got to be a risk, right? Um, you don't want that. You don't want that out there. I mean, it clearly does wield power. It is a ring of power and a ring of greater power than the three rings. Can somebody else who is not Sauron, you know, use it and wield that power? I don't really know. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, no, Elrond is not holding a ring of power at that point. Not on the slopes of, of Mount Doom, certainly. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, so I don't, it would seem to me that, oh, hey, yeah, so, you know, so, okay, we're imagining the scene, right? Isildur throws down Sauron and deals in the killing blow. Then he takes the ring off the finger. Ah, ooh, hot, right? And he's like, hey got the ring in the baggie you can tell from the smoke curling up from the mouth of this bag that the ring the one ring is in here right um and elrond and kirden are like okay um so that was the ring designed to dominate the elven rings um okay that's that's that thing is bad that thing is bad news right um we don't know what it does we don't want it to, to we don't know if it can if anybody else can use it to control the three we don't know if uh that but like it's probably dangerous and in any case it is you know like the greatest relic of sauron let's 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 destroy i mean it's clearly the safe thing to do is to destroy it right but again one of the things that when people sometimes people ask the question how could elrond and kirden justify allowing the ring to go. I mean, it was right there because they didn't know. How could they know that their victory depended upon the destruction of the ring? They wouldn't have known that. Sauron is dead, right? Check his body. He's dead. Um, and uh, uh, so they, they would not have known that their victory would be fruitless if they didn't destroy the ring. Um, and but that doesn't but that's not the same as saying they had no reason to destroy it at all right they did have reasons to destroy it at all it was clearly bad news right um you don't want that thing hanging around you don't know what it can do but i mean it's probably very powerful and it's definitely evil and it was certainly intended for evil um could it be repurposed for good mm, maybe but seriously is that worth um, the risk, um, you know, I no, no. Um, so yeah, the wise thing to do clearly is to destroy the ring, but that's not to say that they knew that everything rested on this, that, that they knew what would happen if the ring was not destroyed. Again, I do not think they have any way of knowing what happened to the ring or what would happen in the future. Right. Uh, what would come to be if the ring were not destroyed. Elrond's regret about this is in retrospect. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and no, they would not understand that destroying the ring would end their own rings. That 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 kind of link. No, I don't think they would have any reason to think that. Um, from what Celebrimbor figured out, as revealed in the in the the ring rhyme, right? Uh, the one ring to rule them all, right? Uh, the, to remove the one ring would just be to remove a threat. Um, remember that there even still is, in the current day, um, there are those who believe that the destruction of the one ring will merely free the three rings to act without restriction, right? That is still, that is still a, a going theory, uh, among some of the elves. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Rococo says, so if Elrond could go back, would he take it by force? That has to end badly. That has to end badly, right? I mean, again, then all of a sudden, like, now we're we're in Smeagol and Deagol uh, territory all of a sudden. Right. Um, if the very first thing that the Ring of Power brings about is a fight to the death among the allies who just overthrew Sauron, I mean, there is no way that's good. There's no way that that ends well. It can't. It can't. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um Yes, and you're right, Matt. Elrond had plenty of time to convince Isildur to change his mind or to convince uh, one of his heirs. Right, exactly. So Elrond would not have thought that it was urgent. Like, it has to happen today or it doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, remember, Mordor was a Gondorian territory for centuries. Centuries after the fall of Dagorlad. Um, yeah, yeah. But again, they didn't figure it out, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, okay. I only got halfway through the paragraph, though. Many elves of mighty men and many of their friends had perished in the war. Anarion was slain, Isildur was slain, Gilgalad and Elendil were no more. Never again would there be any such league of elves and men, for men multiply and the firstborn decrease, and the two kindreds are estranged. And ever since that day, the race of Numenor has decayed, and the span of their years has lessened. Okay. He's winding up, right? Um... His final peroration here is about, you know, a retrospective on the Battle of the Last Alliance, right? Um, it accomplished, it wasn't wholly fruitless, right? It accomplished some stuff, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a permanent victory, right? And what's more, it also marked the passing of an age. We talked about this last time, the significance of ages, right? Um... We're not yet quite in the Dominion of Men. That's going to be the Fourth Age, right? But the Third Age is already, as, a, as Elrond is describing here, we're already getting there, right? Um, the, and, and this is why I think that even Gilgalad might have called it the Last Alliance, right? Because they, they would have known, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Angris says, why are the sons slain, but Elendil and Gilgalad are no more? Uh, rhetorical flow? It's a beautiful sentence. Anarion was slain, and Isildur was slain, and Gilgalad and Elendil were no more. Um, Gilgalad and Elendil are the, the great heroes, right? Uh, and they are, they are no more. Um, I, it's... I, it's poetic. I, 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 again, I said it's a peroration, right? He's, he's winding up here. Um, he's winding up. Um, exactly. It does sound like poetic repetition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bricktail says it's almost like he's quoting from a poem. He could, he could possibly be, he could possibly be, 
Um, yeah, that is interesting, Tony. The, uh, they were the last of their quality, right? Yeah, exactly. To, um, compared to Gilgalad and Elendil, even Isildur and Anarion are kind of small potatoes, right? They died like other men, right? But Gilgalad and Elendil, right? The two great legendary figures of the last alliance, they are no more, right? And there are no more like them, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and the ages are passing. And then he ends. And ever since that day, the race of Numenor has decayed and the span of their years has lessened. Why does he end with the race of Numenor? Again, I think, in part, he is... Because that's not... It's not obvious that he has to end with that, right? Um, yeah. Um, exactly. As Bricktail says, uh, that's going to get under Boromir's skin. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um so, I'm sorry, going back to Galandar's question, what exactly does he mean that elves and men are estranged? Uh, you're right that the elves are not wholly estranged from the Dúnedain, uh, certainly. Um, Gondor, are they friends with elves? Right? I mean, elves and men in general don't hang out anymore, don't live together, don't work together. Remember, back in the old days, Right. Remember Hithlam and that, you know, Hurin and his folk living there with Fingolfin and Fingon and the rest of them. Right. That doesn't happen anymore. Does that happen anymore? That doesn't happen anymore. Right. Um, Elendil and Gilgalad. Right. Setting up, you know, I'd, I'd, Elendil comes and is received by Gilgalad. Right. He like flees from Numenor. And then here he is. Right. He washes up on the shores of Middle Earth and he goes to Gilgalad and he's like, hey, Gilgalad, you know, yeah bad news, Numenor fell, but hopefully Sauron's dead. That'll work out. And, um, um, oh, and um, I'm kind of homeless now, and Gilgalad's like, why not Why not move into the neighborhood, right? Uh, there's a lovely lake just upriver, and he's like, sure, don't mind if I do, right? Um, it's not quite Hithlum, right? It's not quite living together, in it, but still, it's... Um, uh, there was close friendship between Gilgalad and Elendo like there was not. Um, Gilgalad had been a friend of the Numenorians for a while, several millennia, right, ever since the days of Alderion uh, and, and, and backwards. So um, that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. Yes, the line of, like, the rangers in the north still work with the elves, right? But that's a pretty darn small percentage of the kindred of men, right, who now go on most, some of them not even believing that elves exist anymore, right? Hello, Ted Sandyman. I know he's a hobbit, but still, it's the same picture, right? It's a picture of the world. Do the Dunlendings believe in elves, right? Uh, you know, how about the uh, the Haradrim? You know, how about the, the Bardings of Dale? I mean, okay, they, we know they believe in elves because of the elves of Mirkwood. Um, uh, and remember that the proximity there in Mirkwood is... Uh, uh, unusual, right? There we have the kindreds living together near each other and interacting with each other more intimately than we see. It's, it's, it's an exception, right? Um, uh, but anyway, it's, um, it's, it doesn't happen much, right? It doesn't happen much. And, and my, you know, I get the Rohirrim, of course, are the classic example, Right. Think about the Rohirrim and their relationship with the elves. The Rohirrim would be, for me, like the poster children of this sentence, right? And the two kindreds are estranged. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and ever since the day that day, the race of Numenor has decayed and the span of their years has lessened. All right, let's, uh, he then is going to transition to talk about the Numenorean realms, though. 
In the North after the war and the slaughter of the gladden fields, the men of Westerness were diminished, and the city, their city of Anuminus beside Lake Evendim fell into ruin, and the heirs of Elandil removed and dwelt at Fornost in the high down, in the high north downs, and that now too is desolate. Men call it dead men's dyke, and they fear to tread there. For the folk of Arnor dwindled, and their foes devoured them, and their lordship passed, leaving only green mounds in the grassy hills. In the south, the realm of Gondor long endured, and for a while its splendor grew, recalling somewhat of the might of Numenor ere it fell. High towers that people built in strong places, and havens of many ships, and the winged crown of the kings of men was held in awe by folk of many tongues. Their chief city was Osgiliath, citadel of the stars, through the mist midst of which the river flowed. And Minas Ithil they built, tower of the rising moon, eastward upon a shoulder of the mountains of shadow, and westward at the feet of the white mountains, Minas Anor they made, tower of the setting sun. There in the courts of the king grew a white tree, from the seed of that tree which Isildur brought over the deep waters, and the seed of that tree came before came from Arisea, and before that out of the uttermost west in the day before days when the world was young. Okay, okay. Um, this is... Uh, um, yeah, there is some serious time compression in that first paragraph, fourth dauntless. Uh, you're absolutely right there. Um, uh, yes, very serious compression of the uh, of of time. It makes it sound like Arnor barely happened, right? I think that this paragraph, when I was a teenager, did not do very much to. Uh, undermine my impression that Villandil was a ranger in the wilderness like Strider was, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, Tony says he wonders if Aragorn gets annoyed by this, right? <laughs> is, is, is Aragorn sitting there inwardly rolling his eyes? I don't know. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, Again, I ask, why is he talking about this? Why is this important? I do believe that Elend that Elendil, that is <laughs> Elrond, whoever is talking, that Elrond is working off an agenda, right? There is this is not just a this is not just a a, a random lore time, right? Uh, with Elrond, he's not just digressing. He's he has a purpose. Um, and uh, so, why is he talking about the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor? Emphasizing, of course, their decline over time. Remember where he just ended? He just ended his discussion of the Battle of the Last Alliance, right? And the downfall of Sauron and the survival of the ring, and Isildur taking the ring, right? That's all going to be very important later in this meeting, right? A little side excursion to mention the, to mention the shards of Narsil, right? Because that's also going to be important later in this meeting. Um, but now I'm going to do a very short history of Arnor and Gondor, right? Good, Angrist, I think that that seems part of it. Proof that they can't do it again, right? Remember, who's he talking to, right? Uh, let me say this in a more pointed way. If Elrond were to say, okay, show of hands, um, who's ever been, you know, uh, south of Mirkwood in your life? How many people in the room raise their hands? Four? Gandalf? Boromir, Aragorn, Elrond. Anybody else? Anybody else in the room ever been south of Mirkwood? Gorfindel? If assuming Gorfindel was there at the Battle of the Last Alliance, which I I, I like to think he was, yeah. Um, Elrond's sons, probably, probably. We don't, I don't think we have positive evidence of that, but probably, right? Anyway, not many, not many, right? So and re remember where. We started, 
that is where the council begins. This whole thing that we've been taking several weeks to discuss is him, is, um, uh, is Elrond transitioning. They begin their discussion by people raising concerns, what's happening in their regions. They think the agenda of the Council of Elrond is going to be, let's put our heads together and try to figure out the troubles of the world, right? And the trouble of the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain, right, with Sauron the Great and his envoys, is sort of the example of that that we're given, right? Everybody, everybody has... Uh, um, everybody's contributed. There was, and we told, there was a bunch of discussion that we didn't get at the beginning about things that are happening all over the place and troubles and problems. Some kind of solution, right? Some kind of, uh, all right, um, uh, what plans are we going to make? How are we going to get together? They don't know anything about Gondor. They've doubtless heard of it. Right? Um, I mean, Gondor was pretty famous. A lot of people might wonder, hey, so what resources do we have available to us uh, from the south? Right? And one thing that he is doing here is setting up... So this is going back to... Um, uh, who was it? Um, uh, Angrist. Yeah. We're saying that uh, they, they don't think that we're here to have the new last alliance and making the previous one. Now we got to read We got to rewrite the history books and call that one the penultimate alliance of elves and men. Right. One thing that I think he's doing is so he's already said the firstborn have diminished. Right. That's it's not going to happen in that previous paragraph. He emphasized um, never again shall there be any such league of elves and men for men multiply and the firstborn decrease. For men multiply and the firstborn decrease. Well, you know what that sounds like to me? A good news, bad news kind of situation, right? I mean, okay, it's too bad. It's too bad that uh, the firstborn have decreased, right? That's bad news. But men have multiplied. Okay, well, let's work with that, right? Can we get together on that one then and see maybe how that... So he immediately goes on to say, so let's talk about men. what happened to the kingdoms of men, right? Um... What happened to the kingdoms of men uh, and uh, what kind of prospects do we have there? And his very short synopsis does two things. It does one thing primarily for the first paragraph and a half, and then it does a second thing during the second half of that second paragraph. Right. The first thing that it does is describe the decline, especially with Arnor. Their foes devoured them. The fo folk dwindled. Their foes devoured them, and their lordship passed. Right? It's all over. Um, in the south, the realm of Gondor long endured past tense. Ouch, boy, that's got a sting, Boromir. Right? Long endured. Um, not even a... Pre can I can't even get a present perfect on that, Elrond. Right? In the south, the realm of Gondor has long endured. That'd be something. Right? No. No, simple past from Melrond, right? Uh, for a while, its splendor grew, recalling, grew, past tense, recalling some of the might of Numenor. High towers they built, strong places. The wing crown was held in awe, past tense, depressingly past tense again. Their chief city was Osgiliath. Minas Ithil they built. Um, so, uh... He speaks more highly of it in a sense than he does of Arnor, certainly. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but notice what he does in the second half of that second paragraph. He reverses direction. He begins by emphasizing the decline of the kingdoms of the Numenorians in exile, of the Numenorian realms in exile. And then he 
traces them back. He emphasizes the link that the Numenorean kingdoms have to the Elder Days. Minas Ithil they built, Minas Anor they made, there in the courts of the king grew, depressingly past tense again, a white tree. Right? Boromir will know exactly how past tense that growing is. Right? From the seed of that tree which Isildur brought over the deep waters, and the seed of that tree before came from Arisea, and before that out of the uttermost west in the day before days when the world is young. Um... Yeah, yeah. Hey, Foolish Stone, sorry, I see your comments there on Twitch. I do watch that. Not, I'm not interacting with it as much, but I do watch that. Um, you can totally enter that, uh, that comment. Yeah, so anyway, the answer to your question, Foolish, I'll just answer it because I see it. Um, about the, the, what was the Ark, or the Orc army doing? You know, what did they live on from the two years from the end of the war until Isildur and his army happened by? Well, they were up in the mountains. Um, they were coming down from the Misty Mountains. So, whatever goblins in the Misty Mountains ever live on, I guess. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm not quite sure, uh, but presumably there would have been plenty. So um, they weren't just like sitting camped in the Gladden Fields waiting for Isildur to come. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, lots and lots of dwarf ponies, Foolish Stone. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, good. <laughs> Stone giants. I'm not really sure about that. Um, yeah. Um, okay. My last question before we end our, our textual discussion for the evening. Um, why, why does he do this? Again, what's, uh, what's Elrond's plan here? How does this fit into the Elrond meeting agenda? Um, he is certainly emphasizing, yeah, I, I can totally get behind the idea that the overall purpose of that, why he's emphasized, having just said the firstborn decrease and the men multiply, but don't get your hopes up, fellas, right? Because, yeah, the men have been in decline too. There's, there's a bunch of them all over the place, but but Elendil isn't walking through that door, right? That, it's not happening. Um, so, okay. So why then does he emphasize the connection to the Elder Days? Um, he emphasizes that Gondor Gondor especially, because of the white tree that's planted there. Gondor had a living connection to the ancient days, right? But of course he is using the past tense. It doesn't anymore, right? I am, uh, I think I am with you guys. Several of you are suggesting this seems to be more Aragorn setup, right? Aragorn through the line of Isildur and Elendil, um, he, uh, he is also a link back to the Elder Days. Remember, Aragorn himself has already talked about this. Remember his discussion about the, the descendants of Luthien, right? He knows that his line is a direct link back. It's not just a link back to Elendil and the glory days of the Numenorean realms, right? It's not even back to Numenor. It's back to the Elder Days. It's back to Luthien and Baron, right? That is what he emphasizes about himself, though he isn't saying it about himself, right? But when he's singing the Song of Luthien and then giving his little um, prose description afterwards, uh, he isn't... Uh, uh, he, he, that, that's what he emphasizes, the link back to the, the back to the elder days. Um, yeah. Fourth Dauntless, I do think also he is he 
Elrond is setting up he it's important for him to establish the current state of Gondor, the significance of Gondor and the current state of Gondor. Because it is true it is true that Sauron is going to attack Gondor. I mean, he's going to attack a bunch of places. But he's going to really smite Gondor. Um, he's got reason to do this, right? So let's establish why Gondor is important, historically, politically. Let's emphasize all these past tense things, right? That there are fewer and fewer people holding Gondor in awe these days, right? Um, Gondor is not going to be able to solve our problems. But... Gondor is the enemy of Sauron. Gondor is important, right? It's got links that go way back, right? So we're going to need to know this when we're thinking about what's going to happen and what happens next, right? And yeah, Tony, you're right that the conflict with Sauron goes back to the Elder Days as well. Now that isn't what he emphasizes here. You could see that in the Luthien emphasis, perhaps, right, with, uh, uh, with Aragorn. But the emphasis of the tree, right, uh, the White Tree of Gondor, which links back to Numenor, but he only just glances briefly at Numenor, right? Because he's wanting to look past that to Eresia and past that to the uttermost west, right? It is the light of Valinor, which is the thing that Gondor is the heir of, right? That's Elrond's emphasis. In Gondor, for a while, dwelt in the past past tense, grew the seedling of the seedling of the seedling of the first of the eldest of trees, right? Of Telperion himself. Um, the light of the West was reflected in Gondor. Past tense. Um, yeah. Um, and for Thalys, you're right, it's a symbol of the bond between Gondor and the elves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yes, I do think, I do think that, um, this is, this does help to set up Aragorn, right? Um, not that he, Elrond, necessarily has reason to think that the White Tree itself is going to be renewed. Do they know that? I don't think they necessarily know that. Um... I don't think that he's trying to make a direct, quite so direct a hint as that, right? Um, and yet, um, there is a sense in I, he's emphasizing that Gondor is a big deal. There's all that past tense in there, but he places by by showing that Gondor is the direct link to the light of Valinor itself. He is emphasizing that Gondor is a really big deal. Um, the ring is the key to the whole business, obviously. And if they don't succeed in destroying the ring, none of the rest of it is going to matter. But you know what? It's not only about the ring. Gondor and the return of the king of Gondor and the restoration of Gondor as the last living link to the Elder Days. That is important. That's an important part of this story. Gondor matters. Gondor's important. And again, who's going to know that in the room? Right? He's glowing briefed about this. Does he know anything about the history of Gondor? How much does he know? Right? Um, anyway, uh, that... Um, so I think there's kind of a dual purpose here to his emphasizing. Um, it is about Aragorn, I think, but I think it's not only about Aragorn. Um, Gondor is going to be important. Gondor is going to be the, 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 the primary theater of the war. A lot of their effort is um, uh, a lot of their effort is emphasizing the um, uh, uh it, it, the, like, the, you know, winning in Minas Tirith is going to be important, right, later on. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, is he suggesting that Gondor is where Sauron will likely focus his first attack? 
Possibly. Possibly. That's, um, that's, I think, on the table. I don't see this paragraph necessarily emphasizing that. Um, but he's certainly one conclusion that one could draw from that statement, from those statements, is we should all care what happens to Gondor. Arnor's gone, but Gondor is still there, right? Um, you know, it's it's not what it was, but um, uh, but it's still there. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop there for the night. We did get through two slides, so that's good. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me for our discussion here. Um, and uh, we're going to we'll do our field trip now. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, we're going to we're, we're headed back out for a field trip. Feel free to join us on twitch.tv slash Signum U uh, for the rest of our show and our uh, our Lotro field trip. Thanks, everybody. I will see you guys back again next week in f as we move into February of 2020 here. Thanks, everybody, for the discussion tonight. We are getting there. We're getting to Boromir's. Boromir's still holding it in, but he can barely hold it in, right? He's going to interrupt here pretty <laughs> soon. Uh, so we'll get to that pretty soon. All right. I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter. There we go. All right. Good evening, and, everyone. Here we go. And I will... Okay. And goodbye to the folks on the Talon. Thanks for joining us. Okay. All right. So we're on Crick Hall this evening, and we're headed back up to Thorin's Gate doing some more uh, exploration of the Dwarvish lands here. Oh, good. Okay. So I was thinking that when we were talking about uh, making sure that they deposited the Aaron Gondor, right? The, the eggs in one basket situation. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Volanda. Yeah. It, it made me think that, the, you know, I was like one of the more famous instances of uh, a country having to write that into law that we can no longer put all royal eggs in one basket. And that was after King Henry the First party boat crashed off the coast of England right. and took out with him most of the, the Norman monarchy. So there had right. uh, the fight between Maud and Stephen or something like that. But I was just wondering if there's any event or something like that in the history of men. Where they'd put all their eggs in one basket, and it was definitely one of those, oh, no, uh, eeny, meeny, money, you stay here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, it's, um, it's a big deal. It's definitely a yeah. big deal. And it, and it does seem prudent. Um, there is a reference, and I'm forgetting where, I'm, I'm forgetting whether it's in the appendices or whether it's in Unfinished Tales, um, historically speaking, it scarcely matters as both were written in a very similar, you know, point. Um, yes. But I, I think there's a reference that Volandil was born in Rivendell. I mean, that he was like really a child. Um, oh, that, okay. And which, again, is not something that really jives with what Elrond says here. Um, I'm trying to remember that reference. And where exactly that was, but um, but anyway, I mean, it's I suppose it's possible. I mean, it's possible that uh, you know, Isildur dropped not his son but his pregnant wife off in Rivendell on the way down. Um, that is conceivable. Um, yeah, but uh, that's still rather more of a risk, you know. Yeah, yeah. Elf medicine notwithstanding. Right. Exactly. Um, oh, so that that's in Appendix A, Angrist. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I tell you, um, there's nothing like reconciling your dates after the fact. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah, I wonder why he did that. Because I mean, it's you know, <laughs> Elrond says, you know, Valandal, who was but a child, by which he means. But a fetus, I guess, technically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but, okay. Again, like it's 
fine. Uh, Tolkien was good at reconciling things after the fact, but um, uh, he... But his ideas, you know, changed and developed, right? So um, uh-huh. uh, it's... Which is fine. It's totally okay. fine. Okay, so we wandered up the hill here. That's where we found all the interesting Elvish stuff up on the hilltop. There's the old yes. ruin of the party house. and Okay. Now, uh, we had some interesting... Um, some interesting comments and questions from Harungil, um, who I think is the same Harungil who is our cartographer for the Silm Film Project. Um, oh, cool. Had several uh, 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 specific um, field trip observations uh, on the discussion board this week. And one of the things he was saying is that I, I always seem to be ascribing a much older age to buildings that I see in the game than might necessarily be assumed. Um, uh, he was speaking specifically of the Arnorian ruins uh, that like when I see an Arnori, you know, a, a ruin which has the, you know, the, 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 the star of the Dunedain and stuff on it um, that I'm assuming it was built like during the, you know, the, the heyday of Arnor. Um, and that, you know, his point was that there would have been a time, right? Like after the fall of Fornost and b- between that and the modern era. Um, yes. Fornost fell in 1974, if I'm remembering correctly, um, uh, of the Third Age. So it's been, you know, more than a thousand years since the fall of Arnor. Um, and so during that thousand year period, there would surely have been. Um, uh, you know, some uh, survivors, right, of the Numenorians who would still be living on and probably building things under this, you know, in the same structure, you know, the same uh, general patterns and things as before. That's true, but I don't think that most of the things that we've been building, I mean, could some of the smaller, like, houses and things date from that time? Sure, possibly. But, um, I don't think they were building like when we're looking at things like the wall that appears to stretch between Arthodyne and Cardolan, I don't think we're looking at a post fall of Fornos construction there, you know? No, um, no, that had a clear purpose. Right. And even the stuff that we see in Bree, I have a hard time believing because it seems to be in the same approximate state of disrepair as the wall between Arthodyne and Cardolan, right? So, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's some wibbly wobbly magicy wagicky in here too. You know, people who are trained by the elves and dwarf smiths, and you know, there's, there's we have to take into account that there are crafts here that would have been like you know some of the the Greek things. What if they had never been lost? Would we still have more you know more sturdy edifices from times right. that were lost due to bad building periods? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's. It's very true. I mean, you think about the, you know, some of the Roman things which survive, which are amazing, right? Um, because the Romans built things pretty well on the whole, right? Um, and you have to think that when we're talking about ancient Numenorean construction and Elvish construction and, and, and Dwarvish construction, we're talking like that's our baseline, right? Like, yeah. Ro- Ro- Roman engineering has got to be pretty close to the baseline there. <laughs> Taking yeah. also into account the average lifespan of an elf, they might have figured out techniques to last things much longer because they've exactly. been able to test them out for that long. Exactly, exactly. Now, so maybe they yeah. were luridly painting. Maybe that part's missing. Right. You know? Right. It might have been right. really gross colors all over Rudar stuff, but that faded away over time. Absolutely. A lot of these things, these ruins, could be fairly com- could could have been colorful uh, at the time. Um, oh yeah! Remember the red, the red roofs and the red painting and the and the homesteads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Anyway, so now there were some just some 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 interesting points there, and and I, I you know that I it certainly is possible that I'm kind of oversimplifying my historical epochs, right? Thinking <laughs> about the 
the periods of civilizations that we know lived in these particular era, you know, times. But of course, there's a lot of time that we don't really know about. And, um, and often there's centuries in between, you know, one era and another era. Um, okay. So here we are clearly in a working modern area. We've got this modern, we've got this mining equipment, right? Still in use. Uh, we've got these wagons and things over in barrows over here. Um, so this is clearly a working mine, right? This place yeah. is called the Silver Deep Mine, right? This is a working mine. Um, that would seem to, of all the places we've been looking at, this is the one which is most obviously fully modern, modern. right? Modern yep. in the sense of after Thorin moved in. Um yes. And it seems to be the same architecture as most of it. So, yeah, I think... <clears throat> I'm still thinking that there was not too much that was actively dour handy that was in this area. This isn't like... I, I, I just... I can't think from everything that we've seen... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, standing in that courtyard is the beginning of the dwarf quest. Right. When you're watching the company leave for Bilbo's quest. Yes. 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 Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, listen, then we get back up here. This is where we were before. Right. So this, uh, this kind of multi-level, this whole structure that we just wrote up past, right? This multi-level structure here. Notice how this seems to confirm all of our other theories. Right, the same houses with the same, or the same structures, I should say, with the same doors, the same wooden doors, right, on every level, showing that the real business is inside the mountain. All yeah, of this stuff is just facade. Them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, all of this is, uh, uh, is, is, is just facade. Um, but um, cargo base access points <laughs> exactly right and then here's the entrance to our elvish city again mm -hmm. okay all right so let's head back around down i just wanted to close the loop there um yes yeah, so we have seen not very much i think the primary freestanding Dwarvish. Do you want to go in here? Sorry. Uh, wait, where? In inside the cave over here. Oh, did to we? Where the dower, to where the dower hand shrine was. Oh, we didn't go in the cave. Right. Yeah, when you're yeah, let's go in the cave. Yeah. Before I draw any hasty conclusions about dower hand activity and presence, let's go in the cave. Mm-hmm. Okay, because this is what's his face, Scorgrim, right? Yes, Cogram. Well, that's a fairly threatening statue. I am about mm -hmm. to stab you in the face. That's there's no other way to interpret that. Yeah. Is he pointing with his left hand? Yeah, it's like Babe Ruth, he's calling his shot. Yeah, it does. It is like a Babe Ruth. Guy. Like and he's calling your face, right? I mean, you just He's pointing his yeah. finger straight at your face and then the blade is pointed. Notice they do point in the same like if you position yourself so that you're right with the blade directly pointed towards you. The fingers pointed right at you, too. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, it's a pretty cocky move, though. It really implies that there's no way for you to snatch back and get that hand that he's put out. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's true. And so right when you come in the cave, Scorgrim is like, I am going to skewer you. And then, of course, we have the big Scorgrim statue, same posture, down there. So this is a mere replica up here. Mm -hmm. Apart from these wooden beams, which are helping to hold up the roof, which is still open, as the others were, yeah, I'm not seeing much evidence of building in here. That is, what I'm not seeing is any evidence of an internal, sort of deeper, submerged, dower hand you know, culture, Dowerhand yeah. settlement, this. which would predate 
the arrival of the Longbeards? Yeah, this is not like Sarnor at all. No. Sarnor is exactly what I also am kind of contrasting it to. Um, yeah, this is really just a cave. We have these crystals put up for illumination, and of course we have the big statue that has been placed here, carved here. It's all overgrown with it's lichen, so it's clearly old. Yes. This is definitely one of those they didn't want anyone to know they were paying tribute to him. Yeah, so the Dower Hands have been sneaking off here to make this little cave shrine to Scorgrim, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right? But yeah. that's likely relatively modern. I mean, yes, it's covered with lichen, but it doesn't look ruinous. Nothing in here looks ruinous. Um, so, yes. So it's not like Sarnur. Mm -mm. So I really don't see any evidence that... Anything here at Thorns Gate shows that there was a Sarnor like um, that there was a Sarnor like presence of the Dowerhand culture that the that the Longbeards came in and took over this Dowerhand place. I, I'd almost say that wasn't Dowerhandian at all. It was a Longbeardian tribute to Skorgrim. Right. Possibly. Possibly. Um, because this he was moved in here, right? Oh, and no, I can't yeah, go in can't, there. We can't the do that. Yeah. We need the quest to get in there. No worries. It's got this whole Indiana Jones looking sort of thing. It's really cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I pretty much remember it. Um, but anyway, yeah. So um, besides which, this is fairly close to Sarnor. And since Sarnor was clearly their primary place. That is to say, so the conclusion that I'm kind of working up to here is that it seems that when Thorin and company moved in here, they did not just find where the Dower Hands were living and take it over and say, no, no. okay, thanks, this belongs to us now. They built this place from scratch, mostly. Yep. Um rather implies they were still on good terms with the dower hands yes at the time of building yes exactly exactly now we do see plenty of like long beardish sort of cultural imperialism in other sites like we saw lots of old dower hand sites that had long beardish architecture blocking it in front of it replacing it right and where you could mm -hmm. only see just snatches of the old dower handy. So, so I'm not saying that it was completely or congenial. In the elf's case. <laughs> right, right. Or and exactly that's yeah. I, that was that reminds me of a sentence I had started to say but didn't complete earlier on. Almost nowhere do we see completely freestanding dwarvish structures, like just mm -hmm. buildings that don't back onto stone. Right where right. they get, except for. Gondaman. Gondaman. Right, yeah. Gondaman is the big exception where you have the big city on the hill, freestanding city on the hill of the dwarves. And they seem well only spotted. to have built it there because the elves lived there and they took it out. I mean, I... I gotta put something there. <laughs> gotta put something there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's just kind of interesting. Um, Especially since the elves are still there. I mean, not there, but farther down the road, right? Just down the road. And they don't seem to be on terrible terms. It's not like the dwarves here are, at, you know, are hostile to the the elves of Kellendim and Duolund. Um, but it is fairly remarkable that they just took over Gondaman wholesale like that. You get the feeling it was like an eyesore, just structurally and sound at that point. And they're like, I'm tired of looking at that. Perhaps, it's a good strategic yeah. spot. Exactly. Ruin on a hill, we can do better? Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, no of course, like, even from dwarves. here, like, as we can see straight across the way over there, there's the elvish ruin on a hill, right? So yeah. they're clearly not just, like, if we see something elvish, we're knocking it down. Right, because they've left the whole city, which they don't go into, right? They're the stone, the dwarf pavement goes up to a point and then stops. Well, it's in committee, you know. 
<laughs> exactly. Should um, be done within another 70 years. But, um, but yeah, they've left that stuff up there. It doesn't matter. It's not in the way. Um, <laughs> but again, it, it shows a lack of hostility. So clearly they had a function for Gondaman. They wanted to use Gondaman. Um, yes. And it's primarily a watchtower, primarily defensive. Um, well, yeah, with all the, the goblins nearby, you mm-hmm. know, and you could see that was, and the river that they mm-hmm. had to keep an eye on. Right, right. Yeah. Now, the ruins look really cool from here. It looks like, yeah, um, it looks like the, you know, like the, like dinosaur ribs or something. It looks like an old, like, <laughs> like you know, skeleton of a prehistoric beast from here. The big dragon in Tatooine. Exactly, exactly. Yes, I know it's not actually a dragon. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Now, as for the sort of facade of Thorin's Gate itself, mm-hmm. I can't really get far enough back to see it properly no, in no. full. The, it just looks like very colorful marble for a lot of it. Like they just let the stone mm-hmm. do the talking. Mm-hmm. Like it'd be like it'd be outre to to do something tacky with the really good right, stone. like carvings and decorations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's for elves. No, we don't do that. It's good I stone. love the. It I love that. Like, if you you can see up above in this, uh, you know, the little triangular space little, up yeah, above the door, there. you can see what looks like a rose window, right? Uh huh. I mean, the the carving is exactly uh, the pattern that you can see in like a cathedral rose window up above the Westworks, right up above the doors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Except it's just carving into the stone. It's not a window at all. Right? Like, so, which again, like, you know, the dwarves are like, glass? Nah, nah, just leave it solid stone. It's fine. Like, we there don't need it. There is a window when you come in, though. There is something projecting a big beam of light when you come right. in. Right, that's true. I guess it, it must be. So it, it, I guess it, it is. It does not look like a window from here. Mm. But dwarf craft magic. It looks like stone from the outside. Yeah, perhaps so. That would be an improvement. Glass that looks like stone. We do see two different. I don't know about glass that looks like stone, but I know stone that acts like glass and that's right. uh, like mica. Right, that's different. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking about the two different color tones of stone here. Mm-hmm. We've got the brownish one with the sort of gray, sort of bluish gray highlights, right? Mm-hmm. On either side. Here are these... Uh, with these vertical shapes that may or may not be windows and the ones with the downward facing triangles and the arches on either side. And then you've got this sort of more brown and greenish uh, stone that the whole doorway structure is, plus the parts that have the carvings and the stained glass in them. Which look to me like they're patterned after. The, I still think that the we we can see some dower handy influence here, because that's clearly oh, yeah, not. Sure are. Yeah, that's clearly not dower handy architecture. I don't think that's long beardish clearly, and yet the only other place we've seen st- stained glass like that has been in the dower hand, the older dower hand, uh, half ruinous dower hand construction. Yep. So I think that's. I think that's uh, that's emulation there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying, to, still trying to wrap my head. I get the feeling like maybe granite. It's definitely. Uh, it'd have to be able. To, it'd have to be something fairly hard to withstand the elements and stand this long. So. Granite, marble. Yeah, it would have like to. That. It would have to. Just can't tell. But it it is beautiful, and you could once again you can see why it's it's uh, the, the the mountains around here are said to be blue from the tones that we're getting from the rocks here. Right, right, right. Yes, that arid Lewin could be not, you know, merely 
fanciful or figurative, but <laughs> have some kind of root. Okay, all right. Let's uh, let's head in. I don't want to get too caught up. But let's at least look at the entrance hall here. The inside. foyer. Can't go too late this evening. I've been <laughs> I've, I've been going later and later, and I, I don't want to I don't want to keep trending in that direction, and pretty soon be like, well, it's two o'clock in the morning. It's still plenty of time. Um, I do appreciate that. Okay, so you see where that light's coming in from? Uh huh. I can't really see what the source is. Just doesn't seem clear. Ah, see, no, it's not the window. It's a beam. It's not. It is a see beam. that yeah because like that, that was that, that would be way up here in the rafters no no yeah it that's, would be in the rafters you're right that's just all right we gotta look just, where it comes from on the outside <laughs> what a hole I, it's definitely one of those uh it's definitely a keyhole light yeah i have to see where it's coming from i gotta take a look exactly come back outside okay there's once again, there's no evidence of it on the outside. It's, it's just completely that dwarfish, blank. dwarfish magic of being invisible on the outside. Yeah, now, I mean, it could be a small enough hole that it, especially if there's like, okay. Because it's got to be in this, of, in this blank space above the door. Yeah, it does. They have like a series of mirrors and, and, and like white stone to magnify the light or something like that. Well, there is that... There is that greenish lump around it, right? Yeah. Some kind of crystal, maybe? To maybe focus the beam? Could be. Or to diffuse the beam. I mean, if it's coming in through a very small hole, it would just be like a pinhole shaft across this room. But oh, so it's this... widened into a broader beam. Cool. Yeah, it's a shame we don't get rainbow lights like it was refracted by... Like a right, it looks like some kind of some kind of refraction might be going on, um, but uh, I love the moats dancing. <laughs> yes, lighting. yes, it makes me happy. And we have our mountain friends here. What are these guys at the side here? Well, we've seen these guys before. Our right, little these, sentinels. Right, the sentinels with the hammers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Look how cool my axe is. Right, exactly. We've seen them before. So I'm still thinking about this light beam. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, let us not take the light beam out of its context, because of course it's there and it is focused and targeted directly on the statue, so that the beam of light falls upon the statue of Thorin? Mm-hmm. Crown. It is Thorin, the right? Pose. Yes, the uh, same one is in the town square, I believe, but much, much bigger. Okay. Um. Okay, look how dynamic, again, good movement of the beard and his clothes. Yeah, the beard especially is very... Well, I don't know that we've seen that before. Not a beard flowing in the wind? Yeah, and the cape, yeah. There's a definite... You can see there's the line of movement. What is it depicting? Is that a hammer? Uh, it's definitely a hammer. Yeah, so this is, so there are two things that strike me about, yeah, definitely a hammer. And that's not a big old war hammer. Nope. I think that's a like a building hammer. I think this is Thorin the Builder, like Builder of the mm -hmm. Hall, and not Thorin the Hero. And there are two reasons I think that. First of all, that does not look like a weapon he's carrying. Um, it looks like a tool, not a weapon. Secondly, yeah. okay, you're making Thorin's gate, right? In other words, it's decades 
before the quest of Erebor, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Decades before the, the quest of Erebor, you're going to make a big statue praising Thorin. Yeah. How do you depict him? If you wanted to show war hero Thorin, Thorin in his most glorious moment, what do you depict? Well, this is certainly a magnificent metaphysic. Yeah, but I just, but again, I'm, but I'm thinking again historically. So yeah, uh, Luke, that's just what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you got to depict as an Ulbazar, as spiritual cushion says. Yes, Oaken Shield, yeah. which he conspicuously does not have. Yeah, he does right? not have his Oaken Shield. He could easily be right. All you need, replace that little hammer little not very impressive hammer with a big war hammer or a battle axe or even a sword right and you put the oaken branch in his left hand which is right th i mean like this statue could easily be thorn it as an old bazaar he's wearing what could pass for armor at least right Just now he's got his crown kind of shield. no he doesn't broken have any or kind of shield. Broken. exactly right so they could have depicted thorn from as an old bazaar and shown like the hero Thorin, the worthy son of his fathers, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't. They depict him with a hammer building, right? Um, you know, I can't help but remember um, Thorin's own words in chapter one of The Hobbit about sometimes his people stooping to blacksmith work or even coal mining, right? <laughs> um, stooping to blacksmith work. If anything, that's what's being depicted here. Right? Yeah. This is Thorin the craftsman. This is Thorin Thorin the builder. Um, and so, so I think that's the montage where there's that guy knocking the wall down and then you, know, you start the building montage, you know? Yeah. There's yeah. a reason we always start with some big dramatic motion with the hammer first. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and yes, we did see this statue in the in the housing, but it's really striking me here. The significance of what he's holding and what it means uh, is m m more prominent in this very prominent, indeed, spotlit case, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have it in the entrance hall. It's the dominant thing that confronts you. I mean, when you come in the door, that is absolutely what you see, right? They did it on purpose. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is... Uh, Ooh, tile work. Yeah, here we are, and boom! There's Thorin. And we're not quite eye level with him, but you know, it's close-ish, right? <laughs> well, he's the king. We're not supposed to be eye level. Exactly. We're below him. Um, and his hammer shows up very nicely here. But again we see very clearly this is not this is not uh, we're not being impressed with the military might of the Longbeards when we come into their entrance hall here instead we are being impressed by their craftsmanship by their mm -hmm. building right um, and from here it almost looks like lightning striking Milnir. It, it does look a little bit like that yeah yeah and but again in this context it doesn't look like the lightning striking the warhammer. It looks like what? Like, uh, you know, inspiration shining upon the craftsman, you know, the cra upon the, the hammer and anvil of, uh, of, of, of Thorin here. Um, Divine right. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems to me a little bit more... Uh, um, yeah. Um, oh, so by the way, so... Uh, uh, Pontine posted something for us. Let me see if I can okay. have a second. Let me, uh... Yes. Okay, can we see that? That's the statue of Scorgrim inside his tomb, where we couldn't go in? Yeah. Or if it's Scorgrim. Anyway, that's a statue right inside uh, Scorgrim's tomb. I'm it inclined looks to more think... detailed. 
Yeah. It looks it like look... But we have seen this. Remember, I said it looked like a chainsaw carving. Right. I think we've seen something similar. See, I that think... looks like an oaken shield. Right. Well, I think it's the it's the head of the battle axe. Right. He's got the the butt on oh, the ground yeah. and his hand and on the top awesome. of the blades. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see. And is that a long beard or a dower hand, I wonder? Does anyone remember where I saw these uh, faces before? I don't know. We have, we have seen them. We have seen I'm inclined these. to think that that might be a dower hand, but... Uh, yeah. Like a dower hand was statue, it, but I'm not sure. Was it Sarnor? Did we see this in Sarnor? Possibly. I mean, that would make sense if we had. Um... Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. All right. Well, I, I'm going to be tempted in a minute here to, like, go down and explore more, and I shouldn't do that because fight it's late. It. Fight it. I'm going to fight the to temptation. So, yeah. All right. We're going to let Valori <laughs> go to sleep. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've now gotten inside here at Thorin's Gate. So this means we are coming close to the end of our quite detailed exploration of the Arid Lewin region because well. Thorin's Gate was the final frontier and we're now in the building. Uh, so um, I, think, uh, I think after this, we'll have to decide where to go next. Oh, yeah. I don't even Let know where to know go Let us know what next. your suggestions might be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've covered a bunch of areas. But anyway, we can talk about it later on. But yeah, so people can give suggestions. We'll still have at least a week or two inside the Thorns Gate here, certainly. But Oh, absolutely. If not, yeah. not more. There's lots of areas. There's, there's, there's plenty of stuff to see in here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Bye. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.